I had the pleasure of chatting to Jennifer King, Jen, in November 2023. Jen has had a very interesting career, focused on work in education as a teacher in Hackney, London, and then as an educational psychologist for the last 20 or so years, first in Fife and then as principal educational psychologist in Dundee. She now supports our work at the University of Dundee on the training programme. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did and thanks for listening. I came into educational psychology relatively late. I think it was in my late 30s when I did the master's. But I did my undergraduate degree here in Dundee, obviously in psychology. And <laughs> and I did my dissertation on eye movements in reading, which I oh. look back now and I just think that was a bit bizarre. But anyway, it's still a, <laughs> it's still a, a well-founded um thoroughly robust area of research and I can't tell you the details of it but I remember getting to the end of that year and thinking I understand more about eye movement movements and reading it's something to do with semantics and the, the way that you're processing obviously di- literally direct your eye movements it's not EMDR or anything like that and um, but I did think actually how do people learn to read how do children learn to read so it did get me interested. So I thought maybe I could train to be a teacher. And at that time, the only funding for uh, any postgrad courses outside of Scotland, because I was determined that I wasn't staying in Dundee, I was going with all my friends to London. Well, I went at 21 and went to do my postgrad and teacher training in London. And so I did learn how children learn to read and write. But I was very lucky to be working at that time in Hackney. And there were two educational psychologists at that time beginning to test out ideas around solution-focused approaches. Oh my God. So the folk who wrote solution focused approaches in school, Yasmin Ashmal and John Rhodes, were EPs in Hackney at the time. I remember one of them interviewed me about something I have no idea now, I can't remember. But yeah, so that kind of got me interested. And, and I still had this a lot of interest in literacy acquisition. And then I was also dabbling a wee bit. My career has been a bit like that, picking up bits and pieces, doing some work around educational therapy, which had its roots in therapeutic approaches, psychodynamic approaches just because of people I was working with at that time. So I suppose it all was coming together. And then I thought, okay, yeah, this, I know I had a peripatetic role, that's right. So I was moving around schools in Hackney, seeing lots of differences. And I just thought, yeah, I think educational psychology would be a good good Mm. next step. So I applied to do it in London at that time. Yeah, this tells you the current context. There was no funding for EP training at that time. So although I got a place on the East London University of East London um, course, I didn't get funding. Um, I think you could try to get it in different places like sponsorship and stuff. So I just thought it's not now's not the time, and I put it to one side, did, did other teaching stuff, and um, yeah, and then came back up to Scotland through my husband's job actually, and worked in offsite for a bit, which was fantastic. I'd never worked with teenagers before because I was primary trained. That was a real learning experience. And then got on the master's in Dundee in 2000. Did that, got a job in Fife and went to work in Fife for 10 or 11 years. Absolutely brilliant experience. And um, still lots of learning from there that stays with me. Mm. And, and then 10 years ago, came back to Dundee as the integrated manager and principal head site. What a fascinating career path. And I'm interested in... I know you were saying you, I wouldn't put you on the spot to try and remember the details or anything, but what you were talking about in relation to literacy development, because I think there has been a sort of query around what the role of educational psychologists maybe should be or can be around specific things like literacy development or numeracy development. Did any of your learning at that point influence you as an EP and in what way? Yeah, I think so. I think I was learning again about literacy, the pre-educational psychology. I probably let, you know, it wasn't as the educational psychologist work that was influenced. I trained as a reading recovery teacher, which probably still has all of the components of what good learning, not good, but Mm evidence-based approaches to literacy should be and has a kind of strong efficacy other than the cost of it and has a, a simplicity to it, I suppose, which I think is still very easily transferable into classroom practice. But I think the latterly it probably came coming back into exploring literacy again. And I think that's the great thing again about our role is that you can come back and revisit old knowledge. So yes, I think educational psychologists have contributed a huge amount. If you look at the work that Rhea Reason's done and others, in fact, Rhea Reason's work, I was just looking at it the other day. She wrote an article or she did some research with others around noticing and adjusting in relation to children's literacy difficulties. And, and it's brilliant. It's located within... Um, formative assessment, dynamic assessment, it's rooted in 
classrooms, that it's about educational psychologists assisting with that. So I think EPs have to still have a role. I, I think we inevitably, as well as building capacity and others, but the time element of it, we're not there to do individual assessment work any longer, but we do need to be able to comment on it and give some validation, if you like, as opposed to assessment practices or to if local authorities are looking at investing or schools are looking at investing significant amount of time and money into literacy intervention programs, whether it's third wave or read write ink or whatever it might be, then you should go to your educational psychology service, ask them what they think. They'll give you a they'll give you views on implementation apart from anything mm -hmm. else. Look at all the work that Fixon and so on did. That was all around literacy to begin with in the States. So yeah, I, absolutely. And I know there's the dyslexia aspect of it, but I think as Pep wrote quite a good paper on that. Uh, I'm not one of the co-authors, so right. um, I'm a bit subjective about that. It's dead. <laughs> You're allowed to be. It's all I ask Pep, you need to up that paper. But anyway, we're very much about looking at the continuum of literacy and mm. being a part of that. Not everyone believes that. Julian Elliott has written a lot about that. But mm. I sometimes think as an educational psychologist, you've also got to there's a bit about that sort of critical realism in the world that we're living in. And there are people for whom the identification and the acknowledgement of dyslexia is very important. So work with that. Include it within the ecology of what you're working with rather than disputing it, I would say. Yeah, I guess it opens this question again. What do we think psychology is <laughs> and what are different people's definitions of that? But if I'm thinking about it in like the broadest sense of how does our how do our thoughts, feelings and behaviours have an impact and influence over each other, then being able to read and take information from the world in written form and being able to use our literacy skills as part of how we engage with the world and learn about it, then I thought that was quite a helpful space or, or paradigm or something for me to see how everything is very much connected in that way of learning about the world and your place in it and how you engage with it and yeah. interact. And I think, again, there's a rule for psychologists about taking it, when I say further back, it's not, I mean, it's further back perhaps in terms of development, but it's wider than that as well. I read the acquisition of language and thought and um, um, vocabulary. And um, mm -hmm. I think, gosh, if the edu education reform debate, which has moved on, has it moved on? I don't know. I think we're still waiting for the Hayward further thoughts from the Hayward review. But I remember discussing this actually with Laura Ann Curry at the time and she's done a huge amount in, in, in terms of literacy and so on. We have placed so much emphasis on the measurement of reading and writing, probably to the detriment of um, listening and talking. And yet we know that children's capacity for vocabulary and um, language and thought, that's as great and as important as those literacy skills that are perhaps more easily measurable. I don't know. We've indeed got the right measures. Mm. So I think, yeah, I think that there's, I don't know, if, if if it was a brave new world and we were starting very differently again, much more emphasis on children's listening and talking, I think, and what can EPs do from the coaching and the organisational development and the research and so on. Yeah, yeah, like language is a tool, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. What's coming to mind and what I'm really keen to hear your thoughts about, maybe linked to that, and you touched on a few things, is how you would describe or what you would see as a good educational psychologist maybe the kind of skills they'd have the knowledge they might be using um their general way if you like but uh, how would you maybe describe that if you were thinking oh they're a really great psychologist they're a really good educational psychologist wow <laughs> <laughs> just to put you on the spot I think it's something that's not fixed, okay? So I think that's important to see. I think, you know, you've got to have an element of being adaptable to the context in which you're working. So I think that um, because it's it, it, it has changed over the course of time that we've been education psychologists and it will change again. And I think in order to be adaptable and responsive to, yes, the needs that are, that are in front of you, you've also got to be curious and you've got to be um, almost ahead of the curve in some respects, I think to anticipate what's coming next I think that's really important and I think if you remain curious actually then you're open to new ideas you're reflective I yeah. think a good EP is open to feedback open mm -hmm. to challenging feedback as well as we all like to get the nice stuff but being open to critical feedback is really important I think being 
analytical and I know that we we should just expect every EP to be analytical, but sometimes I think in the busyness of stuff, we, we get into being descriptive in our, particularly I suppose around it in the assessment of situations, but actually being really good in terms of your analysis is what's needed in some of the trickiest situations at the moment. Um, and something about leading yourself, I did, I did a, I was really lucky to be able to do another master's with, when I was in my job in Dundee, in public sector leadership, and went back and, well, looked at obviously lots of aspects of leadership and got really interested in some of the work around self-leadership. And that's not to say that we all go off and do our own thing and that we're entirely autonomous practitioners, but we're a small workforce apart from anything else. And you are in situations sometimes where as someone who's got a very strong qualification and has been employed for that purpose and your strategy purpose, you sometimes have to be the person in the space, in the room, in the meeting, in the whatever that leads yourself in order to facilitate decision making with others. And I think sometimes people get drawn into we're just there for consultation and advice. And I think there's a risk in doing that. I think that you have to do more than that. You have to be the person sometimes that will judge what's happening in that space. And if there's somebody not strong enough to support well-informed decision making, then EPs should feel okay about stepping forward. And I'm not saying make the decisions, but get people to a space where a name sometimes, you know, that's that's not but it's it's difficult, or name the tensions that are in the room. It's a bit like that BPS safeguarding model mm-hmm. that we were you and I like. Mm-hmm. Um those wedges as they refer to them around bias and power and group dynamics. Yeah, EPs have to be really mindful of that. So there's lots of different aspects of it. And you've got to you've got to be able to be well attuned. There's a lot mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. self determination, good psychological concepts and theories that make you a good practitioner, good psychologist, um, Mm -hmm. being resilient because it's lots of jobs are tough, but you have to be resilient sometimes on behalf of other people, on behalf of the organisation that you're working with them. Yeah, it's reminded me of things like containment almost as well and just like professional courage, I suppose. Yes, that's a really lovely way of putting it, yeah. Are there any particular tools or ways of learning about these kind of things that you have found especially helpful in guiding your practice? Because I'm sure you do these things. Yeah, I suppose there's there's things over the year, there's some things that stay, if you like. The year ones are obviously have just been doing their VIG, their video interactive guidance. Yeah. That hasn't been a kind of, I haven't been using video regularly over the years, Mm -hmm. far from it, in fact. But I did do it in my training. And I think it's one of the things that really stuck around (laughs) core and secondary intersubjectivity is, is so important to what we do. The, the communication principles or contact principles, being really mindful of those, particularly naming. I, I, I think that when I've been sometimes in the most stuck positions in my work, that's mm-hmm. you sometimes just, that's the place that you're at and you just have to name what's happening, name what you're thinking, name yeah. what you're seeing, name what might happen next. So I think all of that work that came out of Trevarthan and all the rest of it is still very powerful, I think. The all the work around implementation science and implementation methodology, I came across probably when I was doing some work actually with Nancy Ferguson and Jean Campbell and Martin Gemmell. We were doing some work on behalf of ASPEP at that time on Polar, the primary one, oh, yeah, yeah. Thing, uh, assessment resource. And uh, so we were looking at Fixon's work and really trying to emphasize the importance of Polar would go nowhere without strong implementation. Yeah, I, guess, well, I think it's gone sadly as far yeah. as it could have done. Maybe I'm wrong, but but I do think that implementation methodology is um, is certainly something that I I I refer to and I, and have used a lot since that time yeah. in lots of other contexts mm-hmm. in terms of implementation of aspects of GERFEC and mm-hmm. um, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suppose I don't know. Yeah, there's lots. The public sector leadership stuff was interesting, and what is, I had to do a module on negotiation. And and that was a fascinating and, and has a lot of psychology beneath it, obviously, in terms of um, how you approach negotiation and that shared interests and objectivity and a little bit of almost action research. How am I going to anticipate what the best alternative to no agreement is? What's the worst alternative to no agreement? What I was thinking there is, is a lot of these terms or some of them like negotiation and the, was it public engagement course you said you, you yeah. did? They're not typically what we would include on our training programs or even in services 
that I've been part of that you would be thinking, oh, we'll go on a course about this. But actually, sometimes those are the things that we find out with the usual realms that have an aspect of psychology to them that are really useful in a practical sense for EP practice. I remember reading a book. It was like one of these. It wasn't a dummy's guide, but it was nearly that. It looked quite similar on the the cover. And it was like basic guide to project management. Yeah. And that was before I'd looked into implementation science, but it was incredibly useful. It was a very short book, but basically how you're getting teams organized. What's the communication like? Does everyone know what their job is? How are you going to get feedback loops in there? And that is actually what got me interested in implementation science um, was noticing that this is very useful because we're talking about as EPs, wanting to support change in organizations and their human systems. They involve people. And for change to happen at that kind of scale, there needs to be a bit of a plan around it. And there needs to be someone or a body of people taking ownership for it and coordinating things. Yeah, yeah. there there is. There's a lot, isn't there, in terms of, I don't know, other branches of psychology, organizational Mm -hmm. psychology. It brings Mm -hmm. to mind some of the things that you're saying. And I was really, I shouldn't have been surprised, but there was so much new learning that came from those other branches, if you like, of organizational development and leadership. Um, mm. I, do, I do think that we need to be more explicit about the role of leadership in the training of educational psychologists and resistance to change and all those things, because it's helpful. It helps you understand challenging contexts. And I think that's sometimes where the frameworks, the current frameworks, the, the executive frameworks are um they, they've I'm not saying that they don't acknowledge resistance to change, they do, but they evolve in a time when maybe the, there weren't quite such intense pressures on the public sector. It, it did make me think last week when I was walking home, uh, I was thinking, gosh, it's really interesting about those frameworks and where they've arisen from. And a lot of them actually did come from people who were within academia. They may also have been in practice, but they were definitely all from within academia. And so is there something at the moment, particularly at this time when we've got a lot of change going on within the certainly within Scotland anyway within the profession and the model of training and so on do we need to think about the, which framework is reflective of the time that we're in now yeah. certainly some of those pressures that are around yeah because the frameworks have to really take account of the reality at the moment and probably not the reality just now but the reality that's ahead of us yeah so are you meaning in relation to all the constraints actually that exist in the wider education system, which obviously have an impact on EPs. Yeah, yeah. and if, we're, if we're, we're a small profession and there are... Yes, even seeing Shona Robinson's announcement yesterday about the public sector workforce getting smaller, and, and there shouldn't have been a surprise in that, but when you see it in black and white, you think, okay, what's that going to mean for every part of the workforce? But actually, I was thinking from an EP point of view, what's that going to mean? And yeah. I don't just number of PP posts. EPs still working with other parts of the workforce that are getting smaller. Mm. Yeah. And she talks about thinking differently. Yes, absolutely. You do have to think differently. But I think, again, you've got to think about it's not just tweaking around the edges. So I think revisiting the frameworks at the moment is something that's also worthy of a podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We should definitely think about that one. No, I agree. And I think that I suppose what you're making me see, (laughs) helping me understand, is that the frameworks that exist, certainly the ones that have been developed for EP practice, They probably do allow space for some of that, but they're typically used and very much used for like bits of casework or maybe even development work, maybe, but not necessarily to think of like the whole context, really. They don't encourage that. You could include it. Like, I think you could incorporate those bits, but they're not too explicit in indicating that's an important part too, the wider system constraints and things. The one, though, that I've... um, become increasingly interested in is a activity theory so cultural historical activity theory because i found that does seem to be very comprehensive in terms of teasing out all of the parts of the system and then encouraging you to try and identify or see reveal as they would say where the tensions are and it's only by seeing the tensions that you can then actually understand what might be helpful or what is now the object of activity or what is maybe going to be. I like it because it's quite a comprehensive series of tools and methods for understanding really the complexity of a situation and importantly yeah we need to acknowledge that there will be tensions every human system but we don't all know where they are (laughs) sometimes they're a bit hidden so yeah but then we're, we're not 
it is in the Red Frameworks book. We do talk about it at uni sometimes, but it's not one of the most... Not commonly, yeah, actually, when it come across or are used very much at all. And then looking at it more recently, and it's been one of the great things about coming back as a partner tutor, that you go back and you're learning again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, that was one of the frameworks that really struck me as well. Mm -hmm. But it's not perfect. And I think part of the barrier to it is that a lot of the language behind it is very confusing. <laughs> it's a bit. It's a bit. Very confusing. So the part of the, the work for me so far at least has been trying to just try to understand but what are you talking about it's actually what is this and then once I've broken through that a bit I'm like okay I get it this does actually make sense and a lot of similar principles to things elsewhere but it's just I guess compiled in a way that makes sense and like I say what I like is that it gives place to acknowledging there will be tensions and contradictions here and they're quite an important part of the analysis of this situation. <laughs> but yeah, new frameworks, revising the frameworks and developing them, I think that's a great idea as well. That's our, our challenge for the next little while. I'd love to return to what we were talking about before, um, before our attempts at framework reform, which was what you mentioned about leadership and negotiation skills. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because EPs have those skills I think don't they maybe even just naming it something like that negotiation of skill placements or negotiation of and services will do that and as EPs we will do that to some extent as well but I think naming them in a different way it can help raise the focus on those things as being quite central to like you're trying to affect change yeah ab absolutely and it's where those negotiation skills overlap with other aspects so I remember when I was reading a bit like you one of the books that I read I read negotiation like a kind of business manual it's called getting to yes oh um, yeah fantastic books really good mm -hmm. there's aspects of that around objectivity and I remember thinking okay so that's about bringing in does the data say what does the evidence say what does the research say so this isn't Jennifer think just thinking this is what we might do or it's not what the I don't know the school or the nursery or the parent or whatever it's actually where that level of objectivity lies yeah. and good research has objectivity to it if yeah. you like and so I remember thinking yeah that's something I can do that's something I bring in um, and yeah. that neutralizes what can sometimes be a very emotive oh that's an interesting word yeah <laughs> Yeah, neutralising. So the, the other book, I think, from Getting to Yes, was it the Difficult Conversations book? Yeah, I think it was the other project, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah if there are any trainees listening to it, they'll be like, oh my goodness, he's still going on about this book. I still find that book and the framework that it proposes so useful on a daily basis, I would say. And I would replace the word difficult conversations with difficult situations. Yeah think through those three elements of actually try and understand what happened because it's probably more complex than you can see as one person what are the feelings involved and where are there aspects of identity that are being threatened or yeah. people are feeling judged or compromised or something like that and usually there is some element of those three things that's actually playing out and um, creating the difficulty and I think it's helpful in terms of your own practice but helpful in supporting the colleagues that you're working with and the people who you know don't necessarily have the same space to think because they are running really really tight timetables yeah they're both very good examples aren't they they're yeah and what you need to sometimes be holding on to in that moment when you maybe feel that you're being drawn into quick solutions yeah all sorts of directions we could go in too i'd love to pick your brains about all of these things i think exploring things out with what is typically seen as educational psychology and into other realms of psychology as they might be seen on paper has been really useful such as yeah i'm looking at books in front of me things like effective time management alongside reflective diaries and just like a daily ability to almost move yourself from emotion and just reflect with a bit more distance if you can yeah. and try to understand so when I was training we used to have to do reflective diaries every day on placement and they were the bane of everyone's oh we're just home it's really late we have to do these reflective yeah. diaries but it became so ingrained as part of my practice that I still write refle reflective diaries so I would call them morning journals now but I still get up take Five minutes is what I say in my head, but it usually extends a little bit beyond that. But just what are you noticing? What's running through your mind? And I just use the classic thing that we teach the trainees, like what's happening? So what? Now what? Like the Rolf model, I think it is. Yeah. 
it's just hugely helpful and really good way to set up your day. It just helps you predict a little bit, I think, about yeah. how you're feeling now and knowing the things that are coming up in the day. How do you want that to go? Like a bit of rehearsal. <laughs> It's a functioning, isn't it? A lot of parallels of self-regulation and yeah. understanding, you know, what you can, yeah, yeah you can anticipate, recognising how you're feeling, yeah. Knowing that it's probably not always a great plan to just rely on in-the-moment stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. possible. Yeah. It's good to have a bit of rehearsal time yeah. or a bit of thinking ahead to how might that feel, what might, what might be great about it, what might potentially trip things up. So, yeah, I found reflective diaries really useful and also... I think leading on to that, it gives a bit of space in my mind. I might think about, okay, well, say implementation science frameworks might be useful for this, or I'll be thinking about different theories that might be relevant. But always in the back of my mind, it's like a wee checklist is to do with the ethics yeah. and like ethics of EP practice and working with children, young people and families, because psychology is so broad, isn't it? And there's so many different fields that we can draw upon and bits of research that we can learn about and bring in. And for me, to ground it, be appropriate for educational psychology practice, what are the ethical dimensions here and what maybe is okay for business management or something, but maybe feels less okay for, yeah. yeah. So I have found that useful to just bring it back to where is the child or young person? What do they think about this? Who has the power here? And how is that playing out? What is the person at the middle of it experiencing? What are they feeling in relation to like, dignity how they understand what's happening what decisions are being made that are actually having an impact on them that might be based on these great frameworks where are they in it all and are they keeping track with what's being discussed and have they had a chance to contribute those kinds of things to remember to bring it back to the human a bit and it might be that it's fine everything's fine the right decisions are being made but it's always good to just come out of things for a little bit and think yeah actually in a broad sense what's happening here in this human system one of the chapters in you know what we refer to as the red book bob burton's our um chapter on illuminative evaluation captures some of that i think again i came across that quite a few years ago and um maybe it was on the first book i came out i don't know i was actually looking at it from the point of view trying to again to understand my own place as a practitioner researcher if you like yeah but it, it, there's a lot of the questions in that I think they call it the spare wheel model, but anyway, which are around actually what is happening here. Have you got all the voices being represented from those who are furthest from the, the questions that are being asked, if you like, mm -hmm. and it, it's very grounded in yeah, critical realism and yeah. you know, like that framework as well. Yeah, no, it's good. And there's something, isn't there? there's going back to the literacy at the beginning, there's something when you're writing, isn't there? Ah, about the process <laughs> of writing and clarifying your own thinking and creating that space and distance. Yeah. Absolutely. It's funny you're saying that because a method that I am using at these initial stages of my PhD is, we call it autoethnography. Oh. So you're like acknowledging it's an ethnographic study, so it's about EP practice. I am an EP and it's about my own experience of working and being in those um, systems. So it's auto, that's where the auto bit comes from. So you basically have like permission. <laughs> To write about your own experiences and then observe that, include it as a bit of data. And you're right, the process of writing, and you're encouraged to write thick descriptions, the detail of everything, in order to highlight all these different elements of being an EP and being a human and working in all these contexts. It's, at, it's been really fascinating and has been a good fit for me, I think, who like to do some reflective writing regularly. Um, but it has been, it's added another layer. So I would certainly recommend that for people as well. If you were keen to try and understand a bit more of how things are feeling or how your practice is feeling or, or any kind of reflective tool, it's been really useful. And you can write them as like vignettes of particular scenarios that you experienced that, you know, were transformative in some way, but you're not quite sure how it prompts you to bring in all sorts of elements. And as you're, it's like the dialogic learning that we were speaking about in class the other day, as you're articulating that it then forms itself in a different way as well. Your understanding of it changes again. Because you're talking to yourself. Yeah. yeah, you're talking to yourself, yeah. Some imaginary laptop person. <laughs> 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 that's going to be my next question. Do you write it out on a, on a key, using a keyboard or do you use a pen? No, I do keyboard, yeah. I feel like actually the muscles in my arms for writing these days have gone. <laughs> Just not used to it. It's yeah. you know, something that, yeah, I find actually 
a lot harder than I used to, I would say. Okay, so this is great. I guess a couple other things I would love to hear a bit more about are the kind of, I guess, dilemmas that EPs face and how you've seen EPs work through those successfully or what your view might be on how we can work through those, which links to the other bit, which is EPs and decision making. These are pretty complex, multifaceted places that we work in and with cases that are equally complex. So anything that you want to say that we've maybe already covered or not already covered in relation to those, it would be great to hear your thoughts on them. Yeah, I think with the dilemmas, I suppose there's lots, isn't there? But I think for me, we want to reach decisions quickly sometimes based on probably an over-reliance on tacit knowledge over time. And and there's all the stuff around heuristics and shortcuts to understanding and so on. And I think one of the biggest dilemmas you face as an educational psychologist is that you're in your practice world, whether it's a secondary school or a meeting with a parent or a nursery or you're working work, work with education managers or whatever. And somebody wants a quick solution and they want a quick answer and they don't want an educational psychologist asking them lots of questions all the time. And I've had people tell me that and t- that's because... They are also in a space at that point in time where um, they are pressurised through time and and sitting with uncertainty is a hard thing to do. And the local authorities are, they've got their priorities, but they're sometimes driven by financial years, I discovered all the time. So I, I think that the dilemma for an educational psychologist in holding on to your practice and in holding on to your frameworks and... Um, is how do you somehow hold on to that space with somebody and not get pulled into making a, a quick decision about something or offering a very quick solution? Sometimes there are quick solutions and sometimes it's you've got to make a judgment in that context to think about is there an element of risk here that needs to be managed, whether it's a risk to a young person or a risk to that member of staff or the organisation. And actually, at this moment in time, somebody needs to be either quickly signposted to some advice or I've got that knowledge. I can share that knowledge. I don't need to spend two hours trying to co-construct that knowledge with somebody else. There's other times when you've got to switch and think it's really important that we co-construct or that we work on this together. Or you do that over time through the relationship that you develop with that person or that organisation. That is a dilemma. And you've got to be mindful, I think, then of your own tendencies, if you like. And some people are much, much stronger than it than others. Right. Um, and I don't think I was always strong enough in doing that. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one dilemma. And I think the other dilemma, I don't know, one that I one that sat for me personally, I think. A lot of my work's always been driven by a strong sense of social justice. I didn't know that's what it was called back in my early days as a teacher and so on, but I've always worked in areas of high deprivation and recognise that massive inequity associated with poverty and the lack of fairness, if you like. And um, so for me, I think the dilemma has been that when you then look at a need that's in front of you that may not necessarily be associated with poverty, but is a need that is for that family or for that school or for that organisation, but you're actually having to divide up your time and where you think you can make the greatest difference or where the social justice lies in it, um, that for me has always been a dilemma. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. probably my bias, if you like. And I think it's okay to say it's biased, but it's a well-informed bias is probably always to be able to support the work that is as- associated and driven by social justice. But I, I still have to be mindful of the um, the circumstances where parent really needs some support with their young person who's, I don't know, in, in, in great need for whatever reason or so that, I think that's another dilemma. There's others aren't there really? I'm sure you could ask that question of everybody You were just making me think there about that question which is like what is the unique role of the educational psychologist and I tended to try and think what is the psychological need here and what's the level of risk and risk in a broad sense of how critical does it feel like something needs to happen soon or this is going to get worse? And who's the best person to do that? Are they available? How can I communicate with them? Those kinds of dilemmas. And I'd sit in the car. If, say, a meeting's finished and just run things through your mind, do I need to do something now? Or even the meeting, to name it and say, does something need to happen now? Like, how are people feeling about leaving this situation as it is? 
Yeah. When's our next point of contact? Or, yeah. or and that's the emotional thing. containment bit as well, isn't it? Containing distress and yeah. yeah, I think so. And also allowing people to hear, including ourselves as professionals, that we hear what's going on. We hear that this is really difficult, actually, and it is tricky. Mm-hmm. It's tricky for everyone involved, and but we're keen to get it right, and that's why it's maybe worth exploring it a bit more or trying to understand what's happening and where people are at and what's the plan kind of thing. Yeah, but that question of, like, where's the psychological need is one that I've found helpful and possibly more, like, probably later on in my practice than I would, (laughs) should really admit, but actually just narrowing down, like, where's the psychology in this situation? What's playing out here that is psychological in nature? And that's maybe to do with the communication is difficult. So that thing that you thought was going to happen, it's not happened. Why has that been the case? (laughs) It's because everyone's running around trying their best, but they're also exhausted and the communication is broken down and people are feeling like things aren't fair and there's not yet been a space for that to be raised or something. And that's quite hard when you can see or you think you've got a hypothesis or something about what's maybe going on and you're aware there's a million different priorities and to try and have that conversation about, look, if we address this bit, the rest might actually fall into line a little bit and that I would see as kind of part of an EP's assessment of the situation as a whole. Yeah no I, I think that's really helpful and, th- and there is there's something about then making a judgment about and it's not levels are not neat but how do you make a judgment about which part of the the system and the ecology you're working in where where yes you're applying psychology but where change can be affected or actually happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was doing some work recently with somebody and an EP elsewhere and and I was wanting to jump to quite a high level within the system about where change needed to take place. And it's where it did need to take place, more at a kind of systems leadership level. But what the EP was very mindful of, the EP for the school in this case was mindful of, was that the people who were going to be coming back in the next day doing the work, the team of staff, Mm -hmm. were the ones that still needed to be supported to be able to carry on doing their job day after day. Because waiting for the system to change was going to take mm-hmm. far longer. And mm-hmm. I just thought, hey, wow, that's spot on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you want both to happen. So that judgment around risk, and she was seeing staff tired and exhausted and, and uncertain about, and she knew that's where the change had to take place. Yeah. Uh, and she was right. Yeah. 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 So those questions, isn't it, about what would make a difference now and what's the thing that needs to change? that might need to start now, but is going to take a bit of a longer period of time. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I'm sure you'll have had these experiences as well when you sometimes just sit down with a teacher or a member of staff or someone and just, just connect with them, so have a bit of attunement and just really recognise, yeah, this is pretty tricky and give a bit of space and to try and support some thinking around what the next thing that might be a slight improvement might look like. <laughs> And how that might be possible. A bit of hope. Definitely, yeah. And optimism and, yeah, that things can can change. And, and that little bit about what's within you. You talk a lot at the moment with the um, trainees about agency. What's within yeah. your, your agency and your, your own sense of control and influence. The other dilemma, I don't know, professions talked about this for ages, that, you know, and if you look at those historical discussions within mm-hmm. the, the Frameworks book, that we moved away from being seen as specialists, if you like, and being informed by social constructionism and so on. But this, you know, how, how, how and when do you still make it very clear that, yeah, you're, you have got some specialisms actually and mm-hmm. um, be, be, be explicit about them because that's, that's why we exist. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I know because sometimes it feels like those things are like the invisible psychology, like you're just having a nice chat with someone. <laughs> Who needs a nice chat and a cup of tea, but actually there's more there and that wouldn't necessarily be explicitly named typically, but there is more to it, isn't there? Yeah, a lot more. I think it's interesting that businesses can come in and work with schools through PETH and all the rest of it. And I'm not being precious about this. They might not be trained psychologists, some of them might be, but Mm -hmm. there's aspects of psychology in there, but it's presented as something that is very new and innovative and different and all the rest of it and they're not afraid to name any of that and have you seen the influence that that can have on like people's engagement or actual outcomes or i i think it's back to the kind of implementation stuff i think you know unless there's a strong implementation framework and there are others who can facilitate that then 
um, there are some big interventions out there around, let's say, um, support and social and emotional learning. And they're not sustainable without that practice behind it. And I think you can spend a lot of money having a person come in to do that work with you, but they go again when the system has to still carry on and work with what's been. And I think that's another area that we've probably got to be a bit braver, at, particularly in times of financial restrictions and so on, that money does get spent on things that sometimes, I, and I don't mean to be offensive to anybody here, but sometimes clutter the system. Yeah. When in fact, actually, if you co- paid it back to yeah. what, what's essential practice here, <clears throat> underpinned by really good psychology, and if we just got that, yeah, it'll never be right, it'll never be perfect. But if that was the focus, then maybe it would feel less overwhelming for people. Maybe we would get essential practice stronger, more resilient, rather than adding in lots of new stuff. The stuff around mental health and well-being at the moment is massive. It's so big that it's hard to sometimes make sense of it. But actually, there's some fundamentals there that actually could just support really effective practice. And as again, I think EPs can do that rather than us always thinking about how do you manage the next project that's come in or whatever. So streamlining things a little bit. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, streamlining even like principles or values that underpin yeah. all of those things. And that makes it is another one of those things that if you get those lined up, then everything else falls into place a little bit more easily. But again, it's easy said, harder to get there. Yeah. And I think actually there was some work that that's, I think is still taking place in, in Dundee with, with Celsius uh, using implementation methodology around looking at aspects of GERFIC. And there are no quick fixes. It's revisiting practice again and space for reflection, but simplifying it. We, uh, I think some of the assessment and planning aspects of GERFIC are brilliant. And Bridget Daniels and her work around resilience is there within it. It's, it's fantastic. But some of the frameworks we made and the planning we probably made overly complicated and it became too process driven when in fact you just need to really strip it right back like you were saying at the beginning who, who's it for it's for children and young people and the parents essentially mm-hmm. if you're on the receiving end of that you probably do know actually what you really want you don't want a lot of clutter mm-hmm. you don't yeah. want a complicated plan yeah um, you want to know what you're going to take away with you at the end of the meeting or the end of the conversation and it's like you were saying you need to put yourself back in that position again and in relation to the ep role and in- supporting some of that how would where would you see us i think uh, that space for reflection some eps in dundee have been involved in that again thinking about the implementation model if you like they've been the coaches they've been the space for doing some reflection with with education staff and that bit about rehearsal before a meeting and that five minutes afterwards for debriefing um Mm -hmm. thinking really carefully about what are the core aspects of assessment what's really what does strong assessment useful as meaningful assessment look like mm-hmm. we need to do all of that yeah maybe sometimes we have to do some modeling we don't go back and write plans for people but we can be alongside people and reflect with them as they're writing them what's ethical and defensible language that we're using in 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 plans and assessments yeah and sometimes making those models a bit less complicated i think billions matrix is brilliant but it's not straightforward. It's not easy for everybody to understand. Not yeah. used routinely. So why is that? Maybe we need to make it a bit simpler. Yeah. Okay. I remember you mentioning or noting something about psychologists in communities. Was there anything you wanted to say about that? I'm intrigued. I suppose for me, largely in the last few years, um, partly through the role and being connected with um third sector organisations, community organisations. There was something about, yeah, working with those, including one that I'm doing volunteering with at the moment in relation to domestic violence. How can psychology support that work? So that was one element of it. I'd also done a bit with the colleagues in Dundee through Columbia 1400. And I came across a paper which I'd never read before. And it was a, a reflection on the Bevan Report, which obviously was the introduction of the health and social care and the NHS and so on. But there was a, a kind, kind of companion report that Bevan wrote at the time about communities, about mm. the importance of communities and that communities ha- had to be resilient and had to have the same attention and, and infrastructure that was going to be the forthcoming NHS and health and social care system. And of course, what happened was, and I'm really massively simplifying, obviously, what's well, been a, a, a huge historical bit of work, <laughs> but... But we tend to think of how we support people through a health and social care system, and we don't tend to think. We are now, but for many decades, we've not thought about 
the community aspect of it. So I, so that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me a few years ago when I thought, yeah, actually, that is where applying all of these theories of psychology and practices of psychology probably still needs to have a greater influence. And there's a network of it within the BPS mm-hmm. and it's, it's very much founded on social justice principles. Yeah, I am interested in it from that point of view because I think, and I suppose there's a reality check as well, that, that the education, the contexts which are bounded to some extent by what constitutes a a school or a nursery and educational setting now. They're not hard and fast because they're part mm-hmm. of their community that they exist within. And, and I think if you go into a community setting, and I used to go into the community centres in Dundee, they're, they're just amazing places. They're just, that's where people's lives are. And uh, there are people in community organisations making a difference every day to people's lives. Um, and there's a lot of tacit knowledge there. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of tacit knowledge. Yeah. But we know that tacit knowledge can be really empowered and improved with having those conversations and some and all that stuff you were talking about, stepping outside of it. And mm. so, yeah, so that, that's why I'm interested in that more now, I think. And I've got a bit more space to think about it. So, But it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It's people who believe that children and young people grow largely influenced by what systems and people and groups are around that makes complete sense to to look outside the school community as well and extend that into the other communities that our young people are are in families are in and and living and working within yeah often we end up then being drawn into them at what times of crisis or really critical Uh, if a young person's about to to go into secure or whatever or or return from those that, that kind of very intense environment, they're coming back into that community. Or we we'll look at we were with Ada's colleagues on Friday, and we were talking about addressing some of the challenges around children, young people with really complex additional support needs, and their pathway whilst within the not to eighteen part of their lives, if you like, really is the education system. Mm-hmm. Um, how well aligned is it? to the adult health and social care system. And sometimes it's really well aligned, but sometimes it's not because they're still set up differently and they're funded differently mm-hmm. and so on. Yeah, I don't know, intergenerational learning, there's a thing that we could talk about and we don't have oh, yeah. to. No, that's something that happens in communities. You know, mm-hmm. see that happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So. And there there was, I hope I didn't make this up, there was definitely a movement for a while, wasn't there, for educational psychology to be more community-based? Yeah, I'll have co- Colleagues who would be saying well, we are community schools, and they are, and there's probably uh, people taking a closer look at it again. But again, it's the sustainability of it, and it's the model of that, and it's the implementation of it, and yeah, but, but yeah, and and I think there is there's a difference as well, isn't there, about between having communities involved in systems that exist, say in a school, come into a meeting or come in to do this or the next thing which is different feeling from those systems actually going out into the community or being a bit more connected in that way. Yeah, it's where the power lies, really. I might not agree with that, but it, it sometimes that's what people might feel or where the, I don't know, it's where the belief is that the, the weight of decision-making lies. And, mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and I think there are many schools and head teachers who are absolutely open to that and have exceptionally busy working lives, but where they know they are operating in a, the most optimal way is when they've got community colleagues who are working yeah. alongside them. Yeah. Okay. What I would, what I'm keen to ask you at some point, so it can be now, <laughs> is what advice or tips or if you were to summarize some sort of notes of wisdom or something like that for educational psychologists and also trainees, obviously I'm thinking about as well, for a good career, a sustainable career, sustaining yourself and amongst that, doing good work, all that kind of thing. Any tips, advice or thoughts around what you might want to say? Yeah, I was thinking about that in relation to what are the things that have stayed with me that other people mm. have been over the over yeah. the years. And so... One of the things I think that people often struggle with when you're in the early days of your practice is that it just always feels like that you're having to solve problems and, and you want to get past the solving the problem to yeah. the the friendlier bit of work or the, yeah. the, the bit where everybody's in agreement with you. Yeah. But, and, and some advice I was given years ago by a colleague and wife actually was you need to reframe it that engaging with the problem is, is the work. Mm-hmm. Actually, you need to frame it and think about it that way. 
then you're not buttoned up against it all the time that this feels it, is, it can be difficult and it can be hard. But then what if, you, if you're thinking, well, actually, we're reframing this, to be fair, if that's what the problem solving frameworks are about, isn't it? So that was one thing that was helpful. I think another thing that's always been helpful, and part of it did come from looking at some of that work that Bob Burden did. You're a, you're a practitioner researching your own professional actions all the time. And I think if you can bring that in to the analysis of the problem so that you are, you're, you're objectifying it a bit more, if you like, rather than feeling personally or too emotive about it not to say that we all need to be automotive or anything but that I think that can help because it does sometimes that's what you need to do is, is just be a bit more objective and I think using your research skills can really help you to do that um, and I think there's something about so Ellie Alexander who, who died a few years ago and was a really brilliant psychologist and great colleague she said to me many years ago, and maybe I was having an identity crisis at the time, I can't remember. <laughs> and she said, but you just have to be your own psychologist. And I think she, and what she meant was you have to be authentic. And that there are frameworks and there are models and there are people whose practice you might look to that you think is fantastic. But your practice has to be your practice. And it has to, yes, it has to be informed by ethics. And yes, it has to be informed by thinking about your, your the psychological theories that are meaningful to you. But but it's, you know, it's bound up with who you are as a person and your own life experiences and your personality. I haven't even touched on personality. There's a whole interesting idea of psychology. And your resilience and all those things. And as held on to that, be your own psychologist. Doesn't mean you have to go off and be a lone ranger or anything, but don't doubt your own authenticity in your practice. Something very powerful about that, isn't there? And there's something about, maybe the final thing is, don't avoid and I'm not saying people do or avoid the challenges challenges can make you feel deeply uncomfortable that you can you know they touch on those deep-seated emotions of fear and shame and anxiety and all the rest of it but actually those challenging situations they're doing the really hard things those moments where you think it <clears throat> are actually where your practice can really take a shift and where you do become more resilient and you can go back into that next setting yeah. whatever it might be that space where people are feeling angry you can go back into it feeling you can adjust, you can feel a bit more resilient, you can you can rehearse perhaps a bit more. And I think you have to have those experiences the other way around it. And we know that's where resilience comes from. Yeah. Yeah, but it does help, doesn't it, when you've had experience to actually show this is what happened. It wasn't the end of the world in that moment. I've come out of it. Yeah. And usually, in most cases, I had a supervisor. It was actually part of the self-regulation script it's like there's always something we can do yeah when things feel like that is a disaster and sometimes obviously things are very disastrous terrible things do happen and even after that to come out and think and it's back to the agency but I suppose as well after time or as part of the process the recovery process afterwards yeah what is it that we can do there's always something we can do what can we do and examples I often talk about is like when you've come out of a meeting and you think I didn't make the contribution I should have there was something happening there I didn't see it there's always something you can do do you want to pick up the phone and have a chat with the head teacher the next day do you want to do you need to go back and address any of the things that you think were maybe not communicated the way you wanted to or you could do a bit differently is there anything else that might help it might be the timing's not right no there's not but at least you've asked the question is there anything else that I can do and check it out with a colleague if you've got doubts about that and sometimes it's maybe about asking the colleague that might be the one that would be more critical with you and it's, it's reminded me back to what you spoke about, first of all, which was like the ability to be a flexible practitioner. I think you said a good EP is one who is flexible and adaptable. adaptable. You can zoom in when needed. You can zoom out as well. And you can take on that role of being able to do that and see the wood and the trees and everything. in between. <laughs> Amazing. OK, uh, I am aware that time has marched on. It's been fantastic to talk to you. Thanks so much again, Jen. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you for asking me. Not at all. Absolute pleasure and privilege. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Bye. Jillian. Bye.